thanks so much for, for coming to this and for, for being here. My hope um, is to encourage you. I want to flesh out a little bit what I'm doing right now. I'm going to talk about it more tonight. Um, I, uh, I'm a civil rights scholar by training and did my PhD on Martin Luther King at the University of Virginia. I now live and work in Memphis, Tennessee, where I'm reopening the last historic site where Martin Luther King worked. It's an old church downtown um, that was, that's, that's been basically destroyed over the years. We're rebuilding it. It's in the poorest neighborhood um, in the state of Tennessee. And so we're putting that, that uh, back together as a community center at the heart of this neighborhood that we're seeking to redevelop. And if you're interested in wanting to know more about work, uh, my own particular work, um, or how I understand the, the future of work on race and equity issues in America, which is what my life is really devoted to at this point. I'm giving a lecture tonight, which is really about that. And so you'll hear more. I'll show you some, some photographs of the, of the space and, and talk to you about that tonight. This morning, I'm in a different mode of Greg's life, um, where I was a pastor, I'm still a pastor, um, but not in a congregation, but I've been a pastor for 20 years. And when I went into campus, when I went into ministry, I went to seminary, I went into ministry, I did it with a lot of hope. I mean, I had this strong hope to see Christians formed into the image of Jesus, um, to see churches grow and to be these thriving communities where people love God and love neighbor. And then uh, to see cities changed, I came out of seminary at a time when evangelicals were, were, at least white evangelicals were rediscovering the cities, which is, of course, where African-American churches had been all along. But white evangelicals, the cities were suddenly occurring to us. <coughs> and uh, it was an incredibly hopeful time uh, for, for me. When I got into pastoral ministry, first as a campus minister and then as a senior pastor of a, of a university church, um, I began to experience not just hopes but real challenges, and I expect a lot of you who are lay and, and, cl and clergy leaders experience this, where I began to found, feel real confusion in my people. Um, I began to feel a lot of fear in them. Um, I be, the emails that you get on Monday morning about what you said on Sunday, or the things that people say to you as they're walking out of the door. I, I couldn't understand exactly what was happening. Um, and I saw divisions. I saw fear. Of course, every four years during the, elect the presidential electoral cycle, uh, I felt like my entire congregation lost its mind. Um, and, and so we, we really struggled with, what am I experiencing right now? It's deeply confusing where the hopes that I had and the experience that I had had a big gap between them. And it made me, over time, begin to think that maybe some of the paradigms that I had for pastoral ministry and some of the paradigms that I had for um, expectation for my congregation, maybe they weren't right. Maybe they weren't really working. Maybe I, something, something just wasn't working, and I didn't know what it was. And it was beyond the ordinary sort of mundanes of pastoral ministry that don't work. I mean, I did my, did my time reading Wendell Berry and Eugene Peterson and just understanding the ordinary pastoral ministry. But that's not what I was experiencing. I was experiencing something much more systemic that I couldn't describe. And so as I began to work through these issues, I began to think that maybe I needed to reassess and reimagine the what I was forming into my people, what it meant to be um, a faithful Christian in this age. And to do that, uh, I realized I was stepping onto, into a really burdensome task, uh, because on the one hand, it required me to look honestly at myself, um, at the, the, the faithfulness of my presence and my congregation's presence with God. Um, and more than this, it's burdensome because it made me uh, do work to really understand our cultural moment. And I realized I didn't really understand culture like I thought I did. I talked about culture a lot, um, but I usually just meant movies <laughs> or music. And, that, and I didn't really understand, okay, that's cultural appreciation. That's not actually cultural knowledge. Um, and so it's burdensome to do this reassessment. But it's also beautiful because I began to see, okay, I can, if I have the ability to, to, to really reimagine and reassess what it means for the church to be faithful in this time, I can learn what God has done with us and what God wants to do. And I can see what God has done in the world and what God wants to do in the world. And so I set about this task, and this has been probably 15 or 16 years ago, of seeking to try to understand what it meant to be a faithful Christian in this moment. And I didn't want to have the like hysterical, self-absorbed sensibility, like this is the most important era in ever history, and so I have to reimagine everything. That's not what it was. It was just a pastoral instinct that said, something is not connecting, and I need to understand what it is. And so 
What I want to do very, very simply is talk with you about this work of reimagining faithful presence um, in a way that is more constructive within our ministry context, and I, I'm going to ask you to do that with me. And here's how. I'm going to start with a story, okay? So I want you to imagine a woman. Let's say she lives sometime between the 2nd century and the 16th century. That's a, you got a lot of room to work with there. She lives generally in the region of the Mediterranean, okay? So as far south as northern Africa, as far east as modern Iraq. Um, oh, see, I'd go this way, east for you, modern Iraq. Um, uh, as far north as modern France and as far west as modern Spain. So you, are you getting that pe- picture of the world? You have your world maps? Now, I want you to imagine that out of some terrible necessity, she's obliged to make her way on a journey across the remoteness of that world. And she leaves whatever shelter is hers, and she wraps herself in some sort of cloth um, and sets out into the darkness and the wind. And she steps out on her path, and she begins to bend her long course toward whatever village or city she thinks is going to hold her future. She, in all likelihood, is going to spend her days looking for one thing. And do you know what it is? It's a church. She's looking for a church. Now, sometimes these are huge cathedrals. Uh, and you, some of you have been to those in Europe, um, these massive places filled with light. Sometimes they're small parishes. They're tucked away on some side street. Um, some of you have been to those kinds of churches. Sometimes they're going to be monasteries, which are cloistered behind walls. Um, but it didn't matter because each one of those places had uh, the common vocation, which was to be a faithful presence of love in the midst of, of their time. And this is why she looks for a church. Because of all the things that this woman may or may not have known about the Christian church, the one thing that almost everyone certainly knew was that it was a place whose purpose was to welcome you in, to be a light in the darkness, a place of rest, and a presence in the absence. That's where the language of sanctuary comes from. We were people who gave sanctuary to our neighbors. Now, that this is so, and not just like a comic book fantasy that I have of how awesome the church used to be, um, you can see this by the fact that most of these churches had manuals written to guide their members in the reception of guests. Um, and I studied these for a while. They, they range across languages and across traditions, but here's one example from the Benedictine rule written in Italy. Okay? Here's, here's what it says. All guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ, for he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Once a guest has been announced, the superior and the brothers are to meet with him, meet him with all the courtesy of love. The abbot shall pour water on the hands of the guests, and the abbot with the entire community shall wash their feet. Great care and concern are to be shown in receiving poor people and pilgrims, because in them more particularly Christ is received. Think about that. My church did not have a manual on how to welcome guests. We had a welcome team that showed up about three out of every six months, six weeks, you know. Um, and so I think this is an incredible passage and an incredible document, and there are lots of others like it, and a lot of them are bearing witness to the fact that the church saw its role in, this, in the culture to be a place that welcomed the stranger. Now, when I look back at that now from this vantage point of my age, it, it can be difficult to imagine the suffering that that woman that we have in our mind could have been undergoing. I want you to think about it. It's not just her. It's hundreds of thousands of other men, women, and children. Some that were hungry were driven by the absence of food. Some diseased were driven by the absence of aid. Some were exploited, and they were driven by the absence of justice. Um, Some sinners were driven by the absence of grace. And I want you to look at them. I want you to see them in your mind making their way through these streets, through these fields, And as they did that, they were looking for us. And when they found us, what did they find? On the one hand, they found very personal care. It's important to understand that part of the history of the church is the way that we have cared for men, women, and children. Um, In our windows, they found the consolation of knowing that they were not alone. In our open doors, they found the possibility that they could be welcomed. Uh, In our baths, they found the return of dignity. In our kitchens, they found the smell of bread and the smell of wine. In our guest rooms, they found rest, and in our chapels, they found grace, and in our farewells, they found warmer clothes and heavier bags than when they came. But they also found public concern. It wasn't just private, it was also public, because when they found these communities of men men and women living in these churches, um, 
they cared not just for individuals, but for cities. These men and women in these monastic communities largely are the ones who created the educational systems in the European continent. They found, they're the ones who worked with local officials to build a, new structures of economy and law. They were the ones who developed strategies for providing medical care for their cities. Um, and they created new forms of architecture and music that we still travel just so we can go see them. So it wasn't just personal care, it was also public concern. So I want you to see our brothers and sisters around the world working at these things. Now when I think back on this, I think it's so beautiful. Sometimes I just think, man, this is just the best. And I love reading the stories of, of, of church history. Uh, I, um, I care a lot about the monastic movement in Christianity and all the beauty that were there. I find it to be incredibly beautiful. But I also find it to be painful. And here's why. One, because our neighbors are still wandering. Our neighbors still wander. All the men and women and children of this city. Uh, in one sense, it's the old wandering. Um, many millions of our neighbors, especially poor and vulnerable people, live daily in the absence of shelter and food, of aid, justice, grace. A lot of them in Madison had, their, had a bad night last night because your first snow came. And these, these ancient pilgrimages of... of just basic necessity continue among us. And I moved from Charlottesville, Virginia, which is essentially a resort university town, like this one probably is in the summer, um, and into you know the poorest zip code in the state of Tennessee. And this is a reality, just very basic needs all the time. <clears throat> but in another sense, it's a new wandering, because it's a, it's a new age in which our people, in which our neighbors are marked by deep ambivalence about the nature of reality, a deep confusion over the meaning of their own identities, uh, and a real anxiety about the possibility of society itself. You saw this on Tuesday night, and if you happened to brave Facebook on Wednesday, you saw it. No longer do we just live in an age in which we wander down shadowed paths in a dark night under the threat of bandits. Now, in our age, we wander through uncharted abyss of meaninglessness with forces of unspeakable economic, technological, and political power that threaten us. Now our neighbors wander in a new age whose paths are much more treacherous than what they would have found in that age we were imagining earlier. And this is part of the reason I find this account so painful is because the wandering is continuing. But the second reason is because I find it painful is because they're not looking for us. They're not looking for us. Now look, scholarship on the state of Christianity in the contemporary West, whether, who, where it comes from, theologians or social scientists or historians, it basically all agrees that Christianity in most of its historic forms is in decline. Now the pace and, de and degree of this decline varies from place to place and region to region, but overall the trend in the West in terms of its established institutions is not really in doubt. And so whether you, whether you study the religious and practices and beliefs of the socially elite men and women who lead our institutions, and I know Michael Lindsay was here yesterday, and he spent a lot of time writing and thinking about that, um, or if you think about ordinary men and women uh, who live in the institutions that those elites create, most of us, or if we uh, think about the young men and women of an emerging generation who inherit this world, the story is largely the same. Religious uh, beliefs are ambivalently held, Religious practices are widely neglected, and religious institutions are in an undeniable recession. And because of this, uh, it, you have to understand this is not simply some historical anomaly, in my own opinion. This is a, basically a settled fact. Uh, I see that for the foreseeable future. And while, this means one of the, while it means a lot of things for us, one of the things that it means is that our neighbors, when they wander, are no longer looking for us. We're no longer axiomatic for, what, for a place that they think they will find shelter. But here's a third reason I find it painful, because I'm not entirely convinced that we are looking for them. The Benedictine rule that I read to you earlier, that was from a chapter called On the Porter, and that there's a porter whose whole entire responsibility was to sit at the gate and look for the neighbor, and to make sure that the whole community gathered when that, neighbor came, when that pilgrim came, and to greet them as Christ. But I don't think, I don't know that we're doing that as much anymore, I certainly didn't see that in my own in my own life when we were when I was pastoring and that's I think because the church has been driven into an identity crisis I mean where we were one, and it's understandable where we where the the American church especially was now this uh, this self-conscious majority whose vision was widely shared and and it made sense for people to you know um, claim Christianity publicly 
Um, we're now being called to, to live differently. It's a world where we are functioning, ideologically speaking, as a self-conscious minority whose vision of the world is widely ignored, whose influence is evidently waning, and, and especially in university towns like this one, whose goals are increasingly suspect. And so what that means is the community who used to dwell in this social order as both its source and its steward is now being called to indwell it on different terms, not because it is home to us, but because it is home to our neighbors. We're being moved, in other words, from an establishment community to a missionary community. But one of the effects of this identity crisis is that the church has begun to think more obsessively about itself. Many, many of the conferences that I've been to over the past 15 or 20 years are largely about the identity of the church, the future of the church, the meaning of the church, um, the possibilities of the church. And I totally get it. Um, we are having to reconfigure our entire identity. And so some churches, they fear this age, are withdrawing into fortified communities of ritualized fear. It's the bad world out there. We're going to withdraw. Some of you have read a book by my friend Rod Dreher, The Benedict Option. I essentially think this is Rod's solution. I think Rod is wrong on this. I love Rod. Uh, I think it's not Benedictine at all. But I understand why he's doing what he's doing. I do. Um, but other people resent this age, and they set themselves against it in a struggle for cultural domination. Um, and I think we've probably seen that a aplen plenty, uh, especially in this political age. And then still others misapprehending the age, both the perils of it and the promises of it, simply embrace it and celebrate their, their enlightenment while our neighbors slip into the dark. This is why these accounts are painful for me. Not only are our neighbors wandering and not only they are not looking for us, but because we are obsessed with our own identity, it's not entirely clear that we're looking for our neighbors. But even so, when I see these early accounts of the church, I don't just see them with beauty and with, with pain. I also see them with hope because God loves the world. God loves our neighbors. God loves our cities. God has placed us here to reach them and to care for them. And his promises, uh, he promises to do that. I absolutely believe that God promises to build his church and to grow his community and to bear witness to the kingdom of God in this world. And so I'm not afraid, um, even as I'm sad, because I have real hope because Christ is risen. Now, I began to see this, this gap in my own congregation, in my own pastoral ministry, that our neighbors were wandering, that they weren't looking for us, that I wasn't entirely sure we were looking for them for all the complicated cultural reasons that I've just tried to outline. And so it, what I did is I began to set, up, set about this project of trying to, how do I help my church as a pastor? Or how do I help my campus minister? Or how do I help my students begin to reimagine their life in a missionary mode? How do I begin to imagine them and help them reimagine their life in a missionary mode? And let me give you an example of how this clicked for me. I realized that, it, so in a lot of our, in our church, when I was talking about, okay, we need to bless our city, we need to um, build institutions, we're going to start arts organizations, we're going to help start businesses and all this kind of stuff. When I would talk about that from the pulpit, that, that I ended up seeing a thread that that was um, in the evangelical reform world that I'm a part of, that was called the social gospel. Okay? But those same people, when I would get on an airplane with them and go to Nicaragua, they would be all jacked about starting businesses for women and building schools and doing roads and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It was amazing. There it was called mission. But when we landed in the Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, somehow it flipped back and it became the social gospel again when we talked about it in America. And I thought, what is this? You, you know what I'm talking about? You ever see this? Okay, and I thought, what is happening here? And then I realized, oh, when they're in Nicaragua, they understand that they're missionaries. But when they're here, they think this culture belongs to them. And this is an establishment church here. It's a missionary church there. I've got to move them from being an establishment church to a missionary church because that is how they're going to recover their identity, their focus in moving into the world. Does this make sense? And that hit me like an asteroid. Um, I, just, I saw it in the Atlanta airport, and I thought, oh, that's what this is. They know how to do it. They just don't know that they have to do it here. They know how to do it. They know how to be missionaries. They're amazing at it. They're completely happy. They're excited, but they don't know that they have to do it here. And when they come back here, they get scared. And so how do I move this congregation? How do I move my own self to reimagining our presence in a missionary mode? And so to do that, I basically began to, um, to try to work on helping my congregation answer six different questions. 
And I want to tell you that the answers I, I began to come up with at that point in my life, they're not comprehensive, okay? And I think that you are going to have better answers than I will have. But I want to give this to you and say, here are the six questions that we began to work on. And I spent a decade just deliberately and systematically working through this for my congregation because I think the foundation, it really has the foundations of the missionary identity are in here, okay? So here's where they are. The first thing I had to do is I had to help my congregation answer, where are we? Where are we? I realized that a lot of our congregation, um, these are men and women that I adore and have built my life with, but they assumed that we lived in a Christian context. They, they assumed that we lived in a Christian majority where there were like social liberals who were pounding at the gates, threatening to destroy what has been built, and that the goal was at all costs to keep those people from triumphing. That was, that was the basic assumption. This is a Christian nation. It's founded on Christian principles. There's a liberal minority, an activist minority, that is trying to destroy what we've built, and our job is to basically defend America against them. And, the, and that, that animated Christian worship and animated Christian confession. Is any of this familiar to you? Okay, great. Um, now, my assumption, I realized, was very different than that, which is that while we had, while we had, as this country had been formed on Christian principles, although they were the, and, and, and in that sense could be called a Christian nation, although it's the kind of Christian nation that enslaved 8 million people, okay, we have to say that, that there was a sense in which I understood why they were saying that, but I also understand that cultures change. And I believe that this culture had, in fact, changed, and that what we were, in fact, was a post-Christian, highly complicated, post-Enlightenment culture where we saw simultaneously the like, profound hope of the Enlightenment, which was self-governance and education uh, and the creation of wealth and emancipation from all the superstition of, of kings and priests. Um, that, that, was, that was at the heart of the, of the Enlightenment vision, where that stuff had, in fact, happened. And we had incredible education for lots of people, that there was incredible wealth, um, that there was self-governance was happening. At the same time, we also saw the shadows of this dream, that the same Western culture who, through appeal to region, brought education, also brought forth some of the most terrible ideologies in world history, that the same uh, economic productivity that created incredible wealth created unbelievable wealth inequalities that will blow your mind, the same technologies in this world that created the promised emancipation now are being used to enslave us, and if you have children with iPhones, you understand that. Um, and the same self-governance that offered opportunity to individuals uh, has created some of the most selfish societies in the history of the world. Right? That, it's, it's, it's just complicated. And this idea of this pristine thing that we're trying to defend is a nostalgic fiction. And I had to help my people understand that, that they live in a post-Christian moment where it's all contradictory, it's all dappled, it's all mixed together. And that is really important for us to understand um, that, uh, yeah, sure, we, we are bound inexorably to both the promises, uh, many of them animated by Christianity, of the, of the modern period, but also by the incredible failures of that. Um, and, this, and so we live in this contradictory age. And I think that that's important because some of our folks saw, saw, wanted to see our age, um, as I said, as this like pure Christian experience Others were terrified of this age, and they thought everything was horrible and bad, and so they wanted to withdraw from it. And both of those are false. This is just a missionary age. There are really good things happening. There are really hard things happening. Christians don't own this world. They don't own this culture. I have no sense of Christians reclaiming this culture in, in any time. Uh, I don't even know what that would mean, to be honest with you. We live as missionaries in this culture, and so part of my work was to help my congregation answer, where are we? And I think that we are in a missionary moment. That's just the sum of it. Where are we? We are in a missionary moment. And that was the first thing that I really had to help my people with, is realizing, okay, we're not where a lot of us think we are. And how do I do that winsomely and creatively and precisely? Um, and that was the first thing. Where are we? The second question that we had to answer is, what do we believe? What do we believe? Now, I have to tell you, as a pastor, 
it kind of shocked me that I had to think about that. Because I thought, well, like, that's the thing that we all get, right? Like, what do we believe? Especially if you are, as I am, in a Reformed confessional denomination that, like, tells you, right? <laughs> Here it is. Like, you want to know? Here's the book. You just go read it, and I'll talk to you Tuesday. Um, and, but I found this to be really complicated. Um, and the reason for that is that conf- there are a couple of reasons. But I, one of the things that I began to see, especially in a liberal university town, is that confessions... Um, of any kind are viewed to be dangerous. They're a source of terrible violence. And so I think, in my experience, our culture teaches us in no uncertain terms that confessions, these strongly fixed character confessions, um, as religious confessions are, um, they're a source of personal hatred and public harm. That if you have strong uh, beliefs that are exclusive in, in any way that you are doing violence. And that made a lot of people in my congregation confused about how they're supposed to hold their beliefs. And so some believe this account. They, uh, they were like, yeah, look, I don't want to do anything that's going to harm other people. So Christian confession is largely one about personal comfort. It's about me being forgiven for my sin. It's about me finding strength in my life. It's about me finding hope for the life to come. Our confession is fundamentally about personal comfort and consolation. Now, other people resenting this cultural account of confessions, feeling, feeling oppressed by the thought police, by the politically correct people, they turned outward and they began to think of Christianity not in terms of personal comfort, but as a cultural contest. It's like an ideological war. That is what Christianity is about. And we're going to, it's about, and we're going to hold the line on these particular things. And I understand this, but if, personal, if the personal comfort version of Christian belief draws us inward, this one, this cultural contest, draw, draws us outward, but in the, in the context of violence. And again, if you, if you happen to go on Facebook, especially during election season, you see that. You see it. But I, I began to realize, oh, wait a minute. Um, even though my, my people can talk about the Trinity, and they can talk about the Incarnation, and they can talk about the cross, and the covenant, and the resurrection, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the ascension, that they can talk about that. Um, the orientation is either personal comfort or outward conflict, but neither of those is right. What we believe is, about, is rooted not in, in personal, personal um, comfort or in cultural contest, but in divine communion. And here's what I mean by that. We, be, we were made for love by God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And creation is an overflow of His love. We believe that love was corrupted, as Augustine would say, it was disordered by sin, um, and we are tragically disordered in our own loves as, uh, as a result. But we believe that love has come to us once again in the person of Jesus Christ, who uh, both models for us and secures for us by his own effectual work a restoration of our ability to love God, to keep these two commandments that he gives us, to love God and to love our neighbor, And we believe eventually that love will triumph, that in Jesus' return, God will be our groom, that we shall be his bride, and we will dwell together beyond time in a world made new. These are the the broad outlines of the things that we believe. And and there's Trinity and covenant and incarnation and ministry and sin and all of these things that that are a part of this. We believe this. But the point is that this orientation of our confession is one that is is anchored in love and drives us outward in love. Unlike personal, the personal comfort one, it's not just about us being driven inward into our life with God. And unlike the cultural contest one, it's not just us being drawn outward as a form of, of conflict. It's actually us opening ourselves up to the world in love. It's driving outward in love. And I began to realize that I had to reframe the way that I preached and the way that I taught the fundamental doctrines of the faith, orienting them out of the triune reality of love towards God for the lo- love for the world and his promise to transform all things and make them new. I had to shift the way that I talked about these things. And if you, if you um, have the dubious fortune of listening to any preaching that I did over those years, you would actually see that transformation happen. You went from talking very creation, fall, redemption, consummation, cultural transformation, which I still believe. But I realized people were using that as a form of cultural contest. I used to start my preaching with creation. I don't anymore. Now I start it with the Trinity. And you can see that transformation happen because I had to root the Christian conviction in a theology of love. Love of God for the world, love of God for us, love of us for our neighbor, and the triumph of love over all things. Does this make sense? So a lot of it was not about the core beliefs. It was about the way that I framed those. So what do we believe? We believe in the God of love. 
who in the midst of our sin loves us through Jesus Christ and promises by that love to make all things new. And what that did, when my people saw that, that began to open them up to, the na- to their neighbors. It began to open them up to the world, again, based on love. So, where are we? What do we believe? Here's the third question I had to wrestle with. Who are we? Now, this is about identity. If the first one was about context, the second was about confession. This is about identity. And I think that there was deep confusion in the church about who we are and how we're supposed to talk about people. Um, On the one hand, we live in a moment that prioritizes human dignity. We really do. I mean, one of the distinctives of our age, especially if you look at uh, world history, is the belief of identity is one of dignity, human dignity language. And a lot of this is related to the universal um, declaration of human rights that happened. A lot of this is in response to the tragedies of the of the 20th century, but whether you're looking in biology or psychology and politics, however you anchor that, I, I would say a lot of people in this town like would assume that people have human dignity, right? And that's kind of a, that's like a mantra that you have. And I want you to know what a cultural achievement that is, okay? That's a massive cultural atri- achievement that was, that was influenced by Christianity but largely secured by secularists. Okay, that's really important that we understand that that has happened. But we're also an age that practices human, human diminishment. And that's, this is the contradiction here. Um, that in spite of our, our attention to the dignity of human beings, we're profoundly dehumanizing. Because every day in our public institutions, um, we diminish uh, human minds, we shame human hearts, we consume human bodies, we destroy human possibilities, we shame people in public. I mean, all of us see this, but poor people, women, African American, Latinos, minorities, children, they know it. That, that you can be dehumanized like very easily. And so we live in this very confused age about human identity, where on the one hand, we can talk about the image of God, and on the other hand, we cannot even flinch when our public op- officials like publicly shame people. That's weird. And our people are also confused about identity. And so I had to go back in and say, oh, wait a minute. Missionaries have to not only know where they are, they have to know what they believe, that God loves the world, They also have to know who their neighbors are. They have to know what we believe about human beings. And so I began to teach, okay, remember we're creatures of glory. We're creatures of glory made in the image of God and and given this ineradicable dignity. uh, We are robed in light because of the glory of God that rests on us and on our neighbors. And that's important that we have to teach our, our people that, to always see themselves and their neighbors, even those that they hate ideologically, so to speak, are creatures of glory. We also have to tell people that we're creatures of shame, that we're broken by sin, that we're estranged from God and from our own selves. And the Christian church has to be honest about shame, about our failures. This is why we can't lead with self-righteousness in the world, but we have to lead with our own confession. We also say that we're creatures of hope, that because of Jesus Christ come in the flesh and the power of the Holy Spirit and God's commitment to make all things new, we believe that Jesus will make all things new, that people's minds can be renewed, that their habits can be remade, their bodies can be resurrected, which means we can't ever give up hope on anybody. Like, we can't do that. Because we believe that we are creatures of hope. And so in an age that's crying out for a community that coherently and consistently prioritizes human identity and talks about it in terms of dignity, this is incredibly important. A missionary people has to have a conviction about who we are and who our neighbors are that we live out of. And so I began to, as I began to talk about this, as I began to see, um, I began to see my people open up to the fact that their neighbors had incredible dignity. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example of this. It was super moving to me. I got this in a text message. It's one of those text messages that you're like, this is why I went into pastoral ministry. I can retire now. It was from a young woman who was a labor and delivery nurse. And I'm going to say, I don't know where everybody is in, the con- in this audience on the issue that she was concerned about. I'm not assuming that you're all on the same page, but it's just illustrating, okay? She lived in a labor, she worked as a labor and delivery nurse, and a lot of people in her Christian community had given her, um, had kind of confronted her or criticized her because in the hospital there were children that were being born to same-sex couples, and essentially saying to her, like, you shouldn't be helping with these deliveries. I'm just going to let that sit there for a minute. When she began to realize, and she was really captive to that, she felt guilty about what she was doing. When she began to see that these people have incredible dignity, that, they're, that these children, these couples, are, they, ha- they have the dignity of the image of God on them, that freed her to move into this context and to say, 
I am here participating in, with, in this amazing moment with creatures of incredible glory. And that didn't mean that she, she was like affirming everything that happened in their life. That's not how the ethical life works. It meant that what she was doing was acknowledging identity, and that was a baseline for her. That was a missionary identity. And I can tell you right now that those same people who were criticizing her, if they were in Nicaragua or if they were in Tibet, would have no problem delivering Buddhist children. They wouldn't have any problem with that because they see the people are made in the image of God. They had to recover that in, con- in, the, con- in, the, in the midst of a missionary context here. So that was the third identity. The fourth question is, how do we grow? Now, this is about formation. This is about formation. How do we grow? Um, I realized that my people, including me, we had no real, real idea about how to be transformed, how to grow in our own life. And part of this was because we inherited a Christianity who assumed that the schools were going to be on our side, and so we could have like classical schools, we could have Christian schools, and they were going to do that work for us. Um, and there were all kinds of other institutions that were reinforcing, civic institutions, Boy Scouts, et cetera, that were going to tell us how to grow us up into citizens. But a lot of people don't have access to that, and so they came like basically unformed. And what I began to see is that when people were wanting to grow, they were uh, thinking about formation in one of two ways. The first is what I'm going to call a therapeutic account of formation. Here's, you'll, you'll recognize this. The goal of formation in this situation is happiness. And um, because of this, the path to formation is, is insight, understanding who we are. There's, it's this generalized sense of like self-improvement through self-understanding. And because of positive psychology, the goal is happiness. And a lot of my people were totally inside of that model of, of formation. And so I would talk to them all the time about like how, what they were thinking, what they were learning, were they reading Brene Brown? You know, we're talking about this, who I like. We were talking about this stuff all the time, right? Um, but I realized, okay, this is a model of formation here. I need to understand what this is. Um, and I thought, oh, this is a goal about becoming your best self and becoming happy through insights. And that's really, that's, there's something powerful about that. The other is what I'll call a technocratic account of formation. And this is largely driven by management theory. And the goal here, the goal of formation is something like effectiveness, to become a person with technical knowledge required for very complex skills. And so, um, and so the idea here is not the cultivation of insight, but the cultivation of skills. And if you live in a town, as I did, with lots of um, schools, uh, so law schools, business schools, things like that, you, you learn to see yourself as a person who's growing in, in, in that kind of knowledge and those kind of skills. Now, those are both really important. I'm, in fa- I'm a fan of happiness, and I'm a fan of skill. Okay, I like both of those. Um, but even so, I needed to recover a theological account of formation who sees the goal of formation not as happiness or as effectiveness, but as of love, as love. The goal of formation is becoming a lover, lover of God, lover of neighbor. That the goal of formation is to become people who live in love with God and their neighbor, both in their private lives and their public lives. And that required for me the cultivation of practices. So not just the cultivation of insight and skill, but of, of practices that I had to, I, because I was thinking like, why are we preaching all the, I'm preaching all the time, and I feel like I'm working hard at it, and my people are reading the right books, you know, every time Jamie Smith writes a book, it, you know, we're reading it, and we're talking, I mean, like, okay, well, like, they, we're doing the right stuff, why are people not changing? And that's because their habits were not, in fact, changing. Um, and so I realized, oh, I need to move away from an insight-based model to a practice-based model of formation. So there are practices of mind that focus on learning and reading and contemplation. There are practices of heart that focus on prayer and and seeking God. There are practices of speech, teaching people to learn the rhythms of silence and talking. Practices of body, where people have self-care and they have self-control. Practices of friendship, where people can learn both the beginning and the end of intimacy. Um, Practices of service, where people can grow and work and rest. And we built like a structure of formation around these practices, because I realized that we, our culture was acting on our people, and they were listening to sermons for like 20 minutes a week, and their habits were not being shaped. They were just getting some new insights, and so we had to really build a model, model thank, frankly, a monastic model of formation for our people, and our church was just like 1,500 people became what we called a, a non-cloistered uh, monastic community, uh, missionary community that was largely ordered around these habits. Um, it took a while, and it's, we're still a work in progress, and our presbytery had lots of questions. Uh, but anyway, 
um, the, how are we going to form people? That's a, that's a requirement for missionary life is, is substantial um, practices of formation. I'll say this before I move on. How many of you have ever been on short-term missionary trips? Mission trips? Some of you probably, yeah, okay, yeah. Most of the time when you go on these, there's like some formation. Like you either have to journal or you have to read about things or you have to like get in the headspace where you're like, okay, people are going to confront you in the park or because you're a Christian or whatever. We need to be doing those kinds of formation work like all the time here as a missionary context. That's the point I'm making. So the next question is not how do we grow, but how do we love? And this is a question about community, a question about community. Um, Community is at the heart of the Christian vision of the faith. This is how we bear witness to the fact that we are rooted in a community, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, And our neighbors need this. On the one hand, um, because of the absence of community, you know this, that one of the contradictions of our age is that although we have all these technologies that enable us to be connected to one another, we also live in one of the loneliest ages in history um, where people live alone and they die alone. Some of you probably read that article a few, um, I think it was two years ago, it came out in the, I think the New York Times about a woman who had been dead in her apartment for three years and nobody knew that she was even there. Um, the, this, is the, this is the kind of world that we're living in. People are connected but highly atomized. So there's this absence of community. And then there's also like perversions of community that are happening. One of them, of course, is tribalism that's happening in this culture where we build communities around race, class, nation, cultural perspective of people who feel like us, and that now passes for community. It's not community. It's a tribe. Um, and it is a source of so much of our collective racial, economic, and political misery. It's a, it's a perversion of community. And so what we actually have to do is reestablish in the midst of this lonely age and this tribal age, a true model of community if we're going to be a missionary people. And I, uh, I, uh, over time I thought, okay, we have to, here are two ways we can do that. The first is we have to reestablish households as schools of love. How the household becomes a place where people are learning how to love. And I don't just mean nuclear families. We ended up like encouraging houses of men uh, to live together, houses of women to live together in our town, you know, just like a university rental place, you know, people, people move in and then they, they learn like, okay, we're going to keep, we're going to keep these habits together. We're going to learn how to live in community with one another. We had to reestablish this where there are daily practices sustained over time because only, that's the only way I could think about overcoming individualism where we're forming people to be in community because people don't know. Um, and the other thing we had to do is we had to reprioritize hospitality as an extension of love. Um, And that means that I want you to think about the holiness in this age where people are wandering, where they don't trust the church. Um, Think about the holiness of opening the door for someone, about giving them a warm welcome, about setting out that extra chair, giving them a second serving, a warm bed, a gracious farewell, offered to people who are not like us. That is the missionary mode. That is the missionary mode, hospitality in an age of loneliness. And I don't know a more powerful argu- uh, embodiment of against tribalism than this, which is hospitality. And so we began to try to encourage our people not only to establish their homes as households of schools of love, but also to really, really work on the practice of hospitality. The sixth question, the final question, uh, um, is not how do we love, but how do we labor? And that has to do with vocation, it has to do with vocation. How do we labor faithfully in the world? Um, there, the faith and work movement is, and I'm, I'm about to wrap up here, just so you know. Uh, the faith and work movement is a, is a huge deal, and this place here is a, an embodiment of that movement, and people are being encouraged in their vocations to go out and labor for the glory of God and the good of their neighbors. That's happening all over uh, largely American evangelical Christianity, which I think is an, a very encouraging thing. Um, and so... I feel like there's already a lot of wind at our back here, and a lot of people were getting, um, were really getting that. Um, but there are some ways that I felt like we could grow in our church, and there's going to be really important as a missionary people. The first was by enlarging their their sense of the domains of vocation. Here's what I mean. Lots of people understand their work in terms of its individual domain, that the way God calls every individual man, woman, child to understand their gifts, to employ them in their, in their service. And that individual domain is, is incredibly important. It's been incredibly beneficial to the church. But I also needed to add over time to my people um, two other domains. The institutional domain is one, where I had to help people think about institutions because they, their work 
was a part of a larger economic or political or educational artistic institution. And these institutions are incredibly important. And so part of the work was to give them an institutional mindset. Um, and so to see that they are working inside of institutions and begin to think about that. Like, what is the nature of the economy? What is the nature of the education system? What is the nature of the political life? Beyond that, the civic domain. I had to get them to think about the civic domain. For all of our talk about cities, um, and I came into pastoral ministry when Tim Keller was, you all know Tim Keller, I assume, uh, was getting us to think a lot about cities, and it was a complete mind blow. But yeah, he's like, I never heard of him. Um, but the idea here is that um, Christians were called to the city, but what I realized is lots of people had no idea how cities worked at all. Cities were more of an abstraction. They were like a shorthand for pluralism and good coffee or something, you know. Or, unlike in the 80s and 90s, it used to be just be a euphemism for poor people. Um, and when, uh, but we have to think about the civic domain and think about, like, how do we build dense overlapping networks of institutions in our city to seek the common good? So that was part of it, thinking about the domains of, voc of vocation beyond the individual to the institutional and the civic. And then, I'll, and then here, I needed to help them think about the direction of vocation here. Um, People really understood that work was a form of Christian devotion. That is to say, it was directed towards God. That all of our work mattered to God and that in doing our work, we were living in communion with Him. That seemed really important, and I think it is really important. But there was less thoughtful reflection on the neighborly direction of vocation as really, really building the common good. So it's not just Christian devotion, it's also the common good to the work of saying, like, your job is to build a society, to build a city, to build a social order where your neighbors with whom you disagree can flourish. Your vocation is about the common good. It's not just about bearing witness to the life of God. It is that. It's not just communing with God. It is that. It is also very practically, we are going to build structures, we're going to build institutions where our neighbors can flourish. And that was really important to open that space up. Now, um, let me conclude I said at the beginning that, you know, the responsibility of our time together is for the church to reassess and reimagine its faithfulness in the world, um, that it's burdensome and beautiful. And how, then I began to say, how are we going to do this? And for me, it was about working within my congregation and my ministry very self-consciously to build my ministry around answering six questions. First, the question of context, where are we, that we live in this uh, missionary age? Secondly, confession, what do we believe? that we believe in the, the story of love from the Trinity expressed in Jesus that opens us up to the world. Third, identity, who are we? There were creatures of glory, shame, and hope. Fourth, the question of formation, how do we grow? Uh, that we have to grow towards um, the purposes of God, loved with our neighbor, and that has to be lived out in practices in our everyday life. Fifth, the question of community, how do we love? Um, which is to say that we had to revision our households as schools of love, and we had to revision hospitality as the expression of love. And six, the question of vocation, how do we labor? And we, that is to say, we carry out our vocations, not in our, just in our individual lives, but also in our institutional and civic lives, and we do so not just for our life with God, but also for the common good of our neighbors. You with me? Does that all sound familiar to you? All right, good. So what's going to happen if we do that? I don't, I don't really know. I mean, the whole point of a missionary age is that we're making it up. It's an improvisation. That's what it is. It's an improvisation based on love. But here's what I do know. Remember that woman we talked about? Wrapped in cloth and stepping out into the wind, and the hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children who are like her wandering in this world? I know that she lives in your city. I know that she lives in my city. I know all of them do, and that every day they wrap themselves in whatever they have and make their way through the pain of the absences of this world. And I know that God loves them. All these people that I passed on my walk here this morning, God loves them. He delights in their dignity, he weeps over their grief, and he longs for their shelter. And I know that because God loves them, he put you here. And many others like you in the Christian church in this community, a community whose entire pr purpose is to be a presence in the absence of this world, and because of this, I know that the work before us, um, the work of reimagining Christian faithfulness in a missionary mode in our time is not in vain. It's hard, it's confusing, but it's not going to fail. Um, and that as we do these things, as we deliberately give ourselves to the questions, and also to answering these questions in ways that are better than I could have, our neighbors are going to begin to look to us. I believe they will. I've already seen that happen in some places. And in looking to us, they're going to find us because we're going to be looking for them as a missionary people.
And when they do, they'll find not darkness, but light. They'll find not estrangement, but welcome. Not restlessness, but, but rest. And I think in the end, they're going to find us being what we long to be, which is the presence of the love of God in this missionary age. Thanks for listening. We on? Cool. Um, so we're going to take some time for Q&A. Um, and I think we'll have some microphones being passed around um, for anybody that has any questions. But just to, just to start, I have a, a question to get us going. Um, hospitality is something you talked a lot about and seems pretty obviously to be a practice that Christians must recover. Um, in my own experience, and probably in our experience, and I'm sure in your experience, um, one of the main reasons why hospitality doesn't happen is because we're afraid uh, of what might happen by inviting someone in, right? So uh, as an example, I have a friend of mine who was having, he hosted uh, a, a Muslim man who is a visiting scholar from Iran in his house for Thanksgiving, which was beautiful. Uh, but his mom was like really terrified to have a Muslim in their home just because she was scared. Um, and th those kind of, like, that's the kind of, there are, there are fears like that that are in people. Um, and so I'm wondering, that sometimes those fears are legit, like stories of um, e even ministry leaders kind of falling into sin uh, from, you know, acts of hospitality, those kinds of things are happening. So if you could connect the role of formation, which is something that you said, and hospitality, how do those two things interplay? Um, well, gosh, I don't, I don't know how, that, it took a turn at the end, how formation and hospitality intersect. I'll say this, to use the example of the ministry leader who falls into sin because of hospitality, it, that's not hospitality, it's a failure of hospitality. It's a failure to recognize the boundary and the dignities of other human beings. Um, I just don't know um, what else to do for our people except to help them renounce fear. Fear just makes us weird. And it just makes us in, uh, ineffective. It just does. Um, if you were a missionary in another context, you would absolutely know that what you're going to do when you first get there is you're going to begin to love your neighbors and welcome them into your home. Like, that's what you're going to do. And in my general experience, having probably thousands of people in our home, including live with us over the course of years, not one time uh, have I experienced anything other than um, the bestowal of hopefully dignity on people. Now, you know, I think one of the fears that usually plays out, especially when we have people live with us, is like, what if somebody abuses your child or something like that? Um, that's just as likely <laughs> to happen in the church, I'm afraid, um, as uh, letting some outsider uh, come into our home. So I don't, I don't know what else to do except to say, people, say to people who are afraid, when I was thirsty, you gave me a cup of water. Like, full stop. Uh, and th th there's a certain form of self-forgetfulness that is required to be a missionary, to say, like, my job is to open my life to you, to be wise and discerning and to, and to be attentive to the children and be whatever, but I have to open my life to you and trust that I'm welcoming you as Christ and be discerning. So, you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, so I feel like one of the constant mantras that I had to do as a pastor was to consistently urge my people to renounce fear in all of its forms. I'm very interested in your point about formation, and specifically, if you could talk more about what your church, what you did in your church to cultivate habits and to build sort of this monastic lifestyle within, because um, I see that in my own congregation, like I want to encourage practice. There's a lot of teaching, there's a lot of worshiping and singing and studying scripture, but like I said, this hunger for like, well, like okay, like but daily, what are you doing every day? What what is shaping who you are? Yeah. So, uh, again, everything that I'm describing here, if my church staff, uh, my former church staff was here, they would say this is very much in process and we're figuring this out. So uh, there's not one thing about me that's exemplary, okay? This is just to say, hey, I'm going to bear witness to some struggles that I've had and ways that we tried to solve it. Maybe it'll help you. Um, that's, that's really the tone of this thing. Um, that said, here's how it went down. My first week of pastoral ministry, um, 
Well, you'll understand this. So it was a big church in Charlottesville, Virginia, and, you know, as big churches do, they think of themselves as, like, particularly important, and they think of their prior leaders as particularly important. And so you had a sense of, okay, I'm a 31-year-old who's inheriting this thing, and I'm, like, stepping into this, and some mantle is on me. You understand the Christian mantle vibe, right? Okay. So it's a thing. But the first week that I became the senior pastor of this church, the founding senior pastor, who was this, you know, like, prominent dude, Harvard, the whole thing, um, came out as a drug addict. He was addicted to painkillers. Um, and I saw people who loved him, and I also love him. He had been a sort of a mentor to me, um, rallying around him and wanting to bring him back and put him on staff at our church. And I was in this situation as a 31-year-old where I would say, we're not doing that. Um, and what it, what it taught me was that not one of these people was thinking about how he got this way or about what he actually needed. They just didn't want the tragedy of his vocational ministry falling apart, so they wanted to give him a platform. And that seemed insane to me. And then I thought, wait a minute. If they're not thinking about his formation, they sure are not thinking about my formation, because I've been here about five minutes. And I thought, I am on my own. That's what I felt like. I, how do you, and, and I also saw that senior pastors, it was, it was a period where a lot of people that I knew who were senior pastors were like really struggling emotionally or struggling with addictions or struggling financially or people were leaving ministry and stuff like that. So I felt really scared. So I went to one of my associates and said, hey, you know what? I want to understand how Christian formation has worked historically and what are models for the formation of clergy that we could think about here because like the going to conferences thing is not going to cut it uh, because everybody's just looking at your name tag trying to figure out whether you're important. And so I'm not doing that. Um, and so we, we eventually, after some discussion, settled on the monasteries and said, so, well, let's just go do that. So for a year and a half, we essentially read in monastic spiritual formation. You know, I mean, you've got Ignatius, who's like pretty intense, you know, doing a lot of push-ups and stuff. And, and you've got the Benedictines, and you've, and you've got St. Francis, and all of these different communities. But they're all seeking to form people who are involved in ministry, even Mother Teresa. Um, and so we ended up focusing on the Benedictine community. One, because um, it, it was built around a common life in a way that made sense to us. Two, because in this matter, in the Reformed context, the two most quoted people in Calvin's Institutes are Augustine and Bernard of Clairvaux, um, both of whom are in this, and Benedict is squarely an embodiment of this Augustinian um, Bernard tradition, right? It's right in the center of that. So we thought, okay, this theologically, this will make sense for our community, so I'm not like bringing in some complete Jesuit thing into, into this into this Reformed Presbyterian world that's going to just cause me more trouble than I need. So let's do the Benedictine, and let's explore that. And after reading it, we realized, oh, wait a minute. This is not, um, this is about habits. This is about a bunch of practices. And I didn't know that before. And I realized the idea was to move from what I call an insight-based model to a practice-based model. And so we said, oh, well, they all live by a rule of life. Universally, these people live by a rule of life. Um, so this is probably 12 years ago. Um, and so we said, all right, well, why don't we try to see if we can adapt a rule of life for just our cler clergy life? Um, so we began to develop practices based on the Benedictine rule of um, what we called the, the common practices and then the private practices. The common practices are things like we did daily prayer every day together. We did Lexio Divina. We read the Bible together every day. We um, had every week, we had what we called a chapter meeting where we talked not about how you doing, but like, how are you keeping the practices? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was less it was less subjective and more like, did you work out or did you not? Like it wasn't like some um, legalist fest. It was just that we were exploring like how do you talk about what you actually do and not what you think. Um, so we did that and we decided we weren't going to talk publicly about that for three years because we had no idea if this was going to um, be transformative for us or anything like that. Um, and so we eventually, after three years, we thought, okay, well, let's take stock here wow, we've been really changed by this. Um, and so there were the, the daily personal corporate practices and then the personal practices, which I forgot to mention, or things like taking care of your body, domestic life, like working on your house, um, you know, or doing chores around your house. There's relationships, friendships, or creativity, different elements of the rule. And so my basic question every day became not what do I have to do today, but what am I becoming today? That was a huge shift for me. And what are these, how, and what habits do I need to pursue in order to become that, that person in, in, in God? Then we started talking to our elders. We told them at the beginning we were doing this, and they were like, okay, 
Just don't get too weird. Uh, you know, so we, we did that, and then we came back and said, look, this is what we've experienced. We would like to talk about this as a congregation because we think it might be a model for the way we could do formation in our congregation. We're not going to expect everybody to do this. And they said, okay, we'll give it a try. So we taught a Sunday school class on the practices. We used Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together as a way into that. Um, and um, so we did that, and then we had the people in that Sunday school class during the month of Advent try to keep the practices. And then we did. Then we met with them after, which did a survey and said, "What did you like?" And they were, and we realized, okay, these were this. This made sense to them. This was confusing for them. They hated singing with their families at night. Okay, whatever. So yeah, I, I mean, big surprise. So um, they, we then adjusted it and said, "All right, we're going to do a pilot of a practice of the spiritual formation practices at Trinity. We're going to draft a model of this and just preach a sermon series on it, of course, and help explain this to people. And then what we're going to do is ask the congregation to try to work through." one of these practices per season, liturgical season. So we're not saying, okay, now you're a monk, right? What we're saying is, okay, we want you to work on lexio, we want you to work on prayer, we want you to work on habits of speech or of the body. And the idea is over time in aggregate, that would grow. And then so we decided we were going to always have a Sunday school class about one of the six practices that was going to go on all the time. And so it just became a regular sort of formation. Sometimes it's uninspired and lame. Sometimes it feels like... Um, uh, we're just in the in the wilderness here, and sometimes we see like real transformations. And that we also organized our fellows program. We have a, a, a fellows program. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but we had a, it's basically people who graduate from college who come to our church for a year, and we place them in jobs around town. Fellows program began to be organized around the habits, and our children's ministry began to be organized around it. So we began to talk about. But first, we had to talk about teach them about the liturgical seasons, and then about the different practices and habits, and then. We send out a daily prayer email morning, uh, midday, and evening. Um, and so everybody's reading on the Lexio together. Now, I no longer live in that community, but I still do that with them. Uh, and that's, that's essentially how, how it has worked. Um, early on, you were, you were looking at uh, your third question, who are we? Um, you said we, we believe, our culture believes in human dignity and that's a great achievement, but we also practice human diminishment. And the example you gave there was, was that, you know, politicians will get up and publicly shame people and, and so on. Um, then you talked about, you know, well, what do we want to preach about this? Do we, we're creatures of glory because we're in the image of God. And then you also said we're creatures of shame and creatures of hope. And I want to talk about that middle one or ask about that middle one. Is there some tension there between the, that sort of abusive shame that we've had and, and preaching now it says creatures of shame and, and you know how do we how does that match up with creatures of glory and is there some tension there and how do you preach that? That's a good question. I don't I don't think I've ever thought about that question. Um, so I'll think about it now. Um, <laughs> I think the the difference I'm trying to get at is this: like when I talk about preaching that we're creatures of shame, it feels more like acknowledgement. Like we we have sin before God. We d and I think most people know, honestly. Um, do I think that's true? Is that true? I think people who have any sort of emotional self-awareness know that they struggle with shame and fear and that they have done things wrong. It's only a very few people that I've met that are like truly, cluelessly self-righteous. And so part of what I try to do in preaching the, 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 that we're creatures of shame is give people a language for articulating this this broken sense that they have about themselves that's what i think we do in public confession by the way it's in liturgy is just giving we're giving people language for that so one is about acknowledgement and equipping people to talk about their shame um, and helping them understand the sources and the amelioration and things like that for shame through through jesus the other that i'm trying to oppose is what i would call the voice of accusation not of acknowledgement, but of accusation where we publicly humiliate people and we, we scorn them for their shame, we scorn them for their failures and their weaknesses. Um, and that, that's, that's what I'm trying to describe. So I don't think there's a fundamental ten tension. Um, I want to give the people the ability to acknowledge their shame and to do so with hope in the, in the light of the redemptive power of Jesus. What I see now culturally certainly as it's related to politics, is, is almost, it's almost a political virtue 
to be able to shame people in public. Um, whether it's our president doing it or whether it's SNL doing it, that's, that's, that's the same, same sort of function for me is the dehumanization of people. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to get at. So, but maybe I need to change the language if it feels like on the one hand I'm affirming shame, on the other hand I'm opposing it. You know? I don't know. What do you, what do you think? It does. I, it does, and it, it follows on creature of glory, and it, it it and it's followed by creatures of hope, um, because I, to for someone to say we're essentially shameful is to misunderstand the nature of sin and goodness and of evil. We're we're essentially the imago dei, and shame is derived from our failure. Shame is not essential; it's derivative, just like it's parasitic, just like all evil, um, and so. I, I have sometimes heard pastors preach, and again, I failed so many times in my life that I, I'm like very loath to sort of harangue about this, but I have heard pastors preach where I thought, they're just going off right now on all the wickedness in the culture and in people, and I thought, this guy sounds incredibly clueless about his own emotional life. He, he sounds to me some, like somebody who does not, who's not at all in touch with his own shame and his own sense of failure. Um, and I think uh, a lot. I think, frankly, a lot of our preaching about human identity is preached by emotionally immature people who who don't really understand themselves. Um, and I don't think it's hard to spot that. And I think you, it's not hard to understand why it happens either. If you've gone to seminary, as many of us have in this room, you understand you get a lot of formation on doctrine and preaching and things like that. But you can leave emotionally clueless and immature, and uh, in ways that lead you to preach really horrible things about human anthropology. Uh, just wondering if you could uh, tease out a little bit more. Uh, you talked a little bit about this idea of divine communion made for love being overflow and how that changed um, just your approach to preaching and teaching and so I'm, I'm interested in that a little bit more because obviously the creation, fall, redemption, recreation, you're suggesting that, understand that just sends you out to perhaps not to actually love, <laughs> but the, uh, to maybe even just hold back. Um, yeah, just, just take a couple more minutes and flush that out a little bit, maybe an example. Sure. So um, when I started to live by the Benedictine rule, um, I first started as just, I'm going to keep the practices. But over time, I realized um, that, and I wanted to do it because I didn't want to become like this earlier pastor. You know, so it's about self-protection, self-improvement, things like that. Um, I mean, transparently, it was. It was like, how do I not become a drug addict, right? Okay, well, I'm going to, it was, it was like that. Um, but as I got into the, the literature and began to live by these practices, I began to notice that these men and women never talked about um, the perfection of the self in that way, that the practices were actually occasions for them to be in communion with God, that it wasn't about dominion over the self or even fundamentally about, certainly not dominion in the world. It was about communion. And so, like example of that, some of you all ever read Brother Lawrence's Practice of the Presence of God? Okay, you should read that book. It'll take you about 15 minutes. Um, it's, we don't know a ton about him, but he was in this tradition and he was a monk who worked in the kitchen. It's actually, in my, as far as I can tell, the first Christian book on faith and work. And it presents, it presents faith, it presents work not as an expression of dominion, but as an expression of communion. And that, for me, was a huge transformation where I thought, oh, the creation, fall, redemption, consummation, or recreation narrative is super powerful. Um, but it can be 
harnessed instrumentally to a cultural transformation vision that is just about dominion. It's just about conquest. And I understand that Genesis uses the language of dominion in the way that we... Um, but, but I also understand that, um, that there, that can be theologized and liturgized, to make up a word, uh, in ways that, that disaggregate that, nor, that story of creation, fall, redemption, consummation from the larger story of triune love that begins not in a garden but in a community and then ends not in a city but at a wedding um, where all things are made new. And I mean, there's a city in the end of the Revelation, but it's a destination wedding. The whole point is the bride and groom. That's the, po- that's the point. Um, and so the, I've, I've since come to think, no, the Bible doesn't begin in a garden and end in a city. It begins with a, with a community of love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and begins with the inclusion of, of humanity in that community through a wedding. It's a story not of dominion, but of communion. And dominion is simply a participation, insofar as we do exercise dominion, is a participation in God's own care for the world. Um, and so that made me really re-feel my theology. <laughs> and then to try to figure out how I was going to re-say it. Um, it wasn't in any way a departure from, say, the Dutch Reformed account of transformation, but it was a recontextualizing of that tradition, as I think Calvin did, in a larger story of communion, which is when I re- went and reread Calvin through the lens of the Benedictines, which is how I think he should be read, it made sense to me why Calvin called the, the sacrament the kiss of Christ, because he had this like deep model of communion and intimacy and union with Christ as not just a forensic, but a mystical fact at the center of his theology. And that has real implications for how we think about vocation, for example. So um, that, that's what I, have I lost the thread of the question or am I answering what you asked? Okay. Um, yeah, so that, that is, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I want to be clear, I'm not trying to disavow the, the utility of the heuristic tool, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. I'm basically trying to situate it in a, in a more interpersonal, relational, Trinitarian account that when I read Bernard, when I read Benedict, when I read Calvin, certainly when I read Augustine, and when I read, who's my favorite, Julian of Norwich, um, in her book, Revelations of Divine Love, they are talking about life with God in a way that I had not experienced it before. And I think that they're right, and I was wrong. And so I changed the way I taught. We probably have time for one more question. I don't know, Dan, if you were going to close, or I saw one in the front here. So, uh, um, Hopefully it'll come out in the form of a question. Um, so are you, would you say there's definitely seasons where the spiritual practices are along obedience in the same direction, that if you enter into it thinking it's just going to be an upward climb? I mean, for me, I started the spiritual practices out of desperation. Um, I found when I read James, I was blown about that winds came, and I had memorized scripture, and I had done some other things, and yet the wind was was blowing me over. But I did find um, not a lot of camaraderie and a lot of words of caution, like, oh, you're becoming a mystic. And I said, oh, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, And yet it hasn't been a a steady, just a steady upward climb. And I just wonder if you could speak a little bit to that season. Yeah, sure. so one of my favorite things about the Christian liturgical calendar is that we have this thing called ordinary time. Um, and man, what an aptly named season that is. Uh, the longest one also, the, you know, over time, like I, I get kind of jazzed when we get to Advent. I'm like, all right, yeah, I, I know where we are and I love the lights and we got the songs and I can do the practices and I'm like in. And then there's Christmas, it's super fun, you know, and then we've got Pentecost. And I mean, sorry, we've got um, Epiphany. Um, and then we're going to, you know, then we're going to go into Lent. It's going to be... I, 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 I love those seasons. Then we had ordinary time, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. It's like, this is so long, and there's nothing exciting happening here. Uh, I just have to pray every day. Um, and in- interestingly, we're nearing the end of ordinary time right now, and I, like, don't want to do the practices because I'm so over it. Um, just the daily, daily, daily. So, I, yes, the answer is yes. 
Um, and I'm having to grind it out every day. There's definitely that. The, that's where the Eugene Peterson long obedience thing makes total sense to me. Um, that said, um, I've taken great comfort in the ordinary time thing, which has made it less ordinary in two things. One is, um, weirdly, reading Dante's Purgatorio. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if many of you have read the Divine Comedy. Like, the Inferno is, is fairly intense, and not, it's not like you don't read it to your family, you know? Because um, um, people, like, have their faces nailed shut and stuff like that. Purgatorio, though, it's for people who are on the way and purgatory in Dante's imagination, it's um, in the way he's framed it poetically, it's a mountain in the middle of a, of a sea, and it has these circular paths that go up. But it gets easier the higher that you get because you're, you're disentangling from one sin or the other. And the thing I love about that is it's not like I'm going straight up and it's awesome. It's more like this. It's like a mountain passage where you're going like this. But the assurance, and I, got, I was out of bed like three in the morning, struggling with my own spiritual life probably three weeks ago, and I opened Purgatorio, and all the stuff I'd underlined were things like, keep going, your feet are getting lighter, God has not forsaken you, remember you ascend toward the light, that kind of thing. So I found real encouragement from that. I mean, Dante, the whole, the whole model of the, of the divine comedy is one of ascent. Um, and uh, Augustine, um, his notion of the pilgrimage is also one of ascent, too. He believes that we're moving towards this uh, toward, upward, but you don't always discern that it's upward. And so the guide and, and Dante is consistently saying to you, I know you feel like hell is at your feet, but the fact of the matter is you're getting higher and, and pride has dropped from your shoulders, he says. It's this amazing thing. So I've found encouragement from Dante, but I've also found encouragement slash discouragement from um, people like Mother Teresa, people like John of the Cross. Uh, I mean, John of the Cross feels a little intense to me, you know, um, and, and I feel like, man, okay, there's a dark night of the soul. I want to be stripped away, but I would like for things not to just be hard all the time. But even so, at those moments when things are difficult or when Teresa has this incredible experience where she believes that God has told her to start Sisters of Charity, but then she has almost no experience of intimacy with God after that. I don't know if you've read the letters of Teresa that she wrote to her confessor. Um, that was both really scary to me, but also deeply consoling to me. And eventually when her confessor sees, oh, you are now with, you're participating in intimacy with Jesus' suffering in a way that other people are not. You're actually finding communion with him in his pain because you're sharing in that. Oh, I thought that was a really key insight that this person gained from Teresa of Avila and Julian Norwich and John of the Cross. I found a lot of comfort in that where I just, meaning the moments of misery and confusion and despair and I just don't want to do this. I'd rather watch YouTube for eight hours. Like that, those kind of, just to throw a hypothetical. Uh, yeah, yeah th those moments I found in the tradition, they're saying these are the moments when you're identifying with Jesus, his wilderness wanderings in a new way. Um, so you're actually participating and tasting him and his experience in a way that you weren't in these moments when things seem to be. And that has been incredibly helpful for me. Great question, though. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.